Thanks, thanks. Uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce the speaker tonight, Richard B. Frank. Richard and I go back a few years. Uh, we're kind of the, uh, we, we roamed around World War II conferences together for a number of years. And uh, it, Richard is, is, is one of the top researchers I know. I mean, one of the things that typifies his work is the depth of his research. And I think this comes from his background. Uh, so he's, he graduated from the University of Missouri. Yeah, so you know, the re Missourian's reputation. He spent uh, uh, four years in the Army, including a tour of duty in Vietnam as a, as a platoon leader in the 101st Airborne Division. And, uh, and he, he's actually not a trained historian, he's a lawyer. And you know how that goes. <laughs> but uh, one, one of our, our men, one, a mentor we, we share is, is Bart Bernstein out of Stanford University, who we've both done a lot of work with. And, and he tells me that, uh, that uh, from Bart's dealings with, after dealing with Bart for a while and, and, and the way he did his research, Bart looked at him and said, boy, you're a really suspicious person. And, and, and I think that's one of the things that makes his, his scholarship so good, is that he's, he's a trust but verify guy. So. You know, if somebody tells him something, he's going to dig in and find out, okay, that's what he says happened, but is that really nope. what happened? Yeah. Kind of you know, that dilemma we historians have is memory and documents often don't match. And oftentimes you spend your time trying to reconcile the differences between the two. And I don't know anybody who's been better at that than Richard, and, and there's probably no more field, no field where there's been such a clash between memory and documentation as in the Pacific War, and what he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, how many people have seen the HBO uh, uh, miniseries, the, the Pacific? Richard is one of the uh, technical experts for that. When the new DVD comes out, which expands on the Pacific, he'll be featured, a lot of interviews and things. Uh, he's got some interesting stories about that that you might want to get into later, but, but he is, I figure once that DVD comes out, he's, he's, he's going to become so famous that we won't be able to afford to have him here again. So this may be the last time you hear him speak. So with that, I want to introduce Richard B. Frank. Am I working okay with the sound? Before I get into the main presentation, I wanted to share with you all uh, a, what I regard as an important breakthrough in scholarship about the Pacific War that uh, recently, I believe, um, I achieved. Uh, it goes to the uh, fundamental issue of how the Pacific War could have been avoided. And let me explain to you how I came to this conclusion. Uh, back about 1980 or 81, I was reading the standard biography of Admiral Yamamoto. And when the biographer, Agalo, got to the section uh, immediately pre Pearl Harbor, uh, of course, that one young was not available for an interview, so he turned to one of the contemporaries of Yamato, an Inouye, Shigeyoshi, and asked him to explain how it was that Japan got into the Pacific War. And uh, being a sound Imperial Navy officer, of course, you know, uh, understood immediately that the, the real answer was, of course, those idiots in the Imperial Army. And, that was, and uh, he was quoted as saying as follows, that uh, Japanese politicians and army men both underestimated America's natural strength and the spiritual strength of its people, particularly its women. They had the childish notion that since women held such a powerful savior, it wouldn't be long before they started objecting to the war. Well, when I read that, um, now a couple of decades ago, the thought immediately flipped in the back of my mind, gosh, you know, if, they, if they'd only seen Gone with the Wind, maybe this whole thing could have been avoided. <laughs> and uh, that thought just sort of you know, sat there in the back of my mind. And now, Flash forward about 1993-94, I'm reading the Pearl Harbor Papers by Dylan and Goldstein. There's an essay in there by a Japanese naval officer who served in War Beach, a famous historian post-war in Japan. And uh, you flip to the section that talks about the Americans, and he says the following. He says, we had entertained a great error in the survey of the American racial character. We had thought we could easily tackle them and that a race steeped in material comfort seemingly absorbed in a hunt for pleasure, was spiritually degenerate. The Americans that appeared in Gone with the Wind appeared, again, absolutely unchanged in the present war. <laughs> and I read that, and I realized I was really on to something. Uh, 
Then, about five years ago, I was reading this biography of uh, Richard Okin, the famous American submarine commander who was captured by the Japanese, after which he's taken to the captain of the skipper of this one uh, Japanese uh, vessel. And the uh, passage reads as follows. The destroyer skipper returned to the cabin in the evening and began to discuss with his prisoner guest. The conversation ranged from naval tactics to literature. The Japanese officer pulled down a copy of Gone with the Wind, which he called Wet with the Breeze. <laughs> and he said that if officials of both nations had read the story of the Civil War, the Japanese and the U.S. might never have come to conflict. Okay, did not disagree. <laughs> so I, I give it to you that the whole thing could have been avoided by subtitling Gone with the Wind in English and distributing copies in Japan. What I'm going to talk about tonight uh, is uh, basically spins off of a presentation I do about the end of the Pacific War, uh, and basically, but particularly to focus on the issues uh, that I thought were particularly interesting to this audience, which involves some aspects of civil military relations. And uh, the primary focus here is Admiral King, the chief of uh, naval operations. But also, as I was working this up uh, about two months ago, I realized that uh, there's a sort of an interesting contrast and compare between King and the Japanese Emperor, uh, Hirohito. So let me uh, go into this and start, of course, with some sort of the basic background of uh, this area, which has been so controversial. What most Americans today find uh, amazing when you mention it to them is that, is in fact, the, uh, uh, there was no great controversy in the United States over the end of the Pacific War for almost two decades thereafter. Uh, that was a time in which there was uh, what's now been sometimes labeled the traditionalist view, which had basically three main components I've listed for you here. That basically, the use of the bombs were justified, that the bombs had, in fact, ended the war, and that certainly from at least a utilitarian sense of a life saved versus lives lost, the, the bombs were uh, morally justified uh, uh, at war. Uh, that uh, general consensus, which was really only challenged in the trenches at that time, uh, su survived into the mid-1960s, uh, and at that point uh, came under siege from what a group that's frequently been labeled as the provisions. It's, that's not a term I'm comfortable with, because I think any historian who finds new evidence about some event in the past uh, is an effective provision. So I like to call them the critics and call what they put together sort of its purest form, and I call it the critical canon. And basically their argument uh, are, in its purest form is simply that Japan's strategic situation in summer 1945 was catastrophic and hopeless. The Japanese leaders recognized this fact and were seeking to end the war, but American leaders who had the advantage of code breaking and were reading Japanese diplomatic communications and understood the Japanese were trying to end the war, nonetheless went ahead and needlessly used atomic bombs against the Japanese. As to why American leaders did that, there actually are a number of reasons that have been advanced in this critical uh, literature. Uh, of course, the most provocative of this, of course, goes with the label of uh, atomic diplomacy, the notion that the use of atomic bombs against Japan, which really had nothing to do with ending the war with Japan, but everything to do with uh, an opening act of the Cold War and activity in the Soviet Union. Uh, these two conflicting visions of history clashed most famously in 1995 over the display of the Gold <coughs> Gay uh, at the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, and for many people, that pretty much encapsulates where this uh, whole uh, controversy has been. Uh, interestingly, in point of fact, that almost at the same time that this controversy was taking place in 95 in the Smithsonian, uh, there were developments going on sort of stealthily uh, and simultaneously with this on three areas, uh, one of which was the Japanese historians gained access to a lot of additional material that had not been available for decades after the war, uh, diaries, documents related to economic principles with secondary characters who had a lot of interesting things to say about them. Every conversations. Uh, the death of the emperor, of course, contributed to uh, an opening up of a lot of things. There was also uh, the fact that uh, American archives began disgorging material, particularly on radio intelligence, which roughly coincided with the uh, Noah Gay controversy. And finally, at the end of the decade and into the uh, first uh, part of this century, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, provided the opportunity for uh, access to certain Soviet archival documents that provided some very interesting new information about this period. So uh, this is what I call sort of the new history. This is what I'm going to talk about now is based really upon not what uh, was the uh, entrenched viewpoints from 1965 to 1995, but basically what we know now, both what I did in downfall and some uh, information that's become available since that time. Now, the starting point uh, for this discussion is American strategy. Uh, 
President Roosevelt, uh, particularly the American War Aim, is unconditional surrender at the Casablanca Conference. It's public at the Casablanca Conference in January 1943. Uh, unconditional surrender was uh, derived as a policy with almost no reference whatsoever to Japan. It was all related to Germany, uh, making sure that the Germans were thoroughly beaten and that there would be a, um, uh, ultimately that, unlike World War I, a military victory would be followed by a political settlement that would ensure an enduring peace. Uh, unconditional surrender was also important from a uh, legal standpoint under international law, because unconditional surrender gave us the right with our allies to go in and do what Ross Perot and a later generation were called under the hood work in, in Japan and Germany to fundamentally do some restructuring of those societies to make sure we never again pose a threat to peace. And the uh, bureaucratic apparatus, state, army, navy, uh, in the period from 43 to 45, was working out this program of uh, reform that would be implemented uh, after both the German and the Japanese surrender. And that's why unconditional surrender really was not something that we could totally back away from or abandon, in my view, because it really is fundamentally connected to the, uh, the, uh, the post-war uh, reforms in Germany and Japan. Now, devising a strategy to secure this national warning was the job of what was then new uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, they, um, and, and in the earlier version of the history of this period, uh, they tend to be depicted as having reached a sort of consensus agreement as to how America would uh, go about in terms of military means securing an underworld of Japan. Uh, the fact was, however, that uh, it seems, it seems clear to now that they really never achieved uh, what I would call a consensus. In, in fact, the most they were able to achieve what I would call an unstable compromise because there was a very fundamental uh, division of vision between the Army and the Navy. And interestingly enough, that division of uh, that, that division between the Army and Navy was not based so much really on what we would normally think of as pure military factors. It was based much more on really what most people would call a political factor. That both uh, institutionally both looked at the situation and really looked at the question of what was the factor that was most likely to undermine the will of the American people to see the war through to the national war aim of unconditional surrender. And that division was one of a question of time versus casualties. The Army, led by George C. Marshall, uh, believed that time was the critical element. Marshall, in a post-war interview, would famously say that democracy cannot fight a savage's war. Uh, American army strategy was based on the notion that invasion of Japanese home islands was essential, not because that's what armies do, but because that was what the swiftest way to bring the war to conclusion and maintain the uh, commitment of the American people to seeing the war through to the surrender. The Navy had a very uh, different view. Uh, the Navy had an extraordinarily proprietary sense of ownership about the war with Japan. Uh, there was no little arrogance involved in that, in fact. The Navy had studied the war with Japan from 1906, particularly between the two world wars, and uh, the Naval War College and around war rooms for uh, literally for decades. And they had reached a number of other fundamental conclusions about how a war with Japan should be fought, and particularly how to go about ending a war with Japan. And uh, one of the most uh, essential conclusions that the Navy reached uh, was as following. Here you'll have to indulge me while I use a, a technical legal term. Nuts. The Navy thought you'd have to be nuts to want to invade the home islands of Japan. They believed that Japan would be able to mount far more men to defend the home islands than the U.S. could ever move across the Pacific as an expeditionary force. Moreover, the Navy realized quite correctly that at that time, everything in Japan that was not, uh, was, it was flat, was soaked. Everything that was not flat and soaked was steep. Therefore, all the American advantages of mobility and heavy equipment and things like that were pretty much negated. <clears throat> Therefore, the Navy came to the conclusion very early in the studies of uh, a war with Japan that the only sane strategy to bring the war to a final conclusion was a strategy of blockade and bombardment. Uh, two points about that. Uh, the first of which is that when the Navy talked about bombardment, they were not thinking just about ships bombarding the shore from, uh, from offshore, but they began thinking about using aircraft to bomb, bomb, bomb Japanese cities from the 1920s. Uh, the more you know, significant aspect about this, and one aspect that in the controversy seems to me, controversy seems to me, be overlooked or underplayed, is the fact that this strategy of blockade was a, a truly, truly radical draconian policy. 
Uh, the Navy was going to follow the example that the British had uh, created in World War I for a blockade not merely uh, related to keeping munitions from reaching a belligerent, but to extend to virtually all items, and particularly including food. Uh, ultimately, blockade was aimed at the threat of, or the actuality of, starving Japan uh, to death, starving millions of Japanese to death. Uh, I'm amused by some of the critical uh, canon where they, they quote this apple with that apple saying, well, you know, we could have won the war without the atomic bombs. Well, they said that, but what, were they, what was their alternative strategy? Well, they're talking blockade, and uh, blockade had an extraordinarily high cost. Now, uh, the uh, debate on this strategy you know, began in 1944 in earnest, continued right up into April, May, uh, 1945, where at that point the Joint Chiefs uh, reached what I call an unstable compromise. They issued an official order uh, that directed uh, that an invasion of Japan, which was the first phase of that invasion of Japan, uh, set, set for November 1st, 1945, it was called Operation Olympic. It was an invasion aimed towards the issue of the southernmost Japanese home island. At the same time, the Joint Chiefs were issuing uh, this order. Uh, Admiral Ernest J. King, the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, got out pen and paper, or as you open, uh, start typing, and issued a memo to his fellow members of the JCS. And you have to understand that King was not a guy given to a lot of loose talk. Uh, and when King put something into writing, it was like the, uh, it was like the commercial on oh, E.F. Hutt, you know, when E.F. Hutt talks and people listen. Well, King in this memorandum on the 30th of April 1945 uh, made it very clear to his colleagues that uh, basically he was only agreeing at that point that the Joint Chiefs should issue an order for an invasion so that all the necessary preparations could be mounted in order that that option would be available come the 1st of November 1945. But he said in this memo in April 1945, this, but the question of whether we'll actually invade Japan, we will revisit in August or September of this year. So basically, King was making it quite clear that he was not agreeing that the armed forces of the United States were going to actually conduct the invasion, only the preparations for that should be made. And he made it quite clear that he thought that they would come back and fight over the issue of whether there really would be an invasion come uh, the latter part of uh, August, in August and September. Now, at the same time that the Joint Chiefs was issuing this order, they also adopt a stats paper that sets out all the uh, rationale for their policy making. Uh, and what I find <coughs> very significant in the staff paper in terms of overall American perceptions about uh, how World well Japan was going to go in 1945 is the Joint Chiefs said this. Look, the national war aim, war aim is unconditional surrender. But we have a problem here. Uh, first of all, no Japanese government has ever been known to surrender in some 2,600 years. The second problem is no Japanese military unit has been known to surrender throughout the entire course of the Asian Pacific War. Uh, therefore, it's not clear that we can obtain uh, the surrender of the Japanese government, or that if the Japanese government surrenders, that the Japanese armed forces, or all of them, will necessarily comply with that surrender. And I can't uh, underscore enough, I think, in terms of this whole controversy, that this is one of the really important points. This is the ultimate American nightmare defined by the Joint Chiefs at this point. April 1945. It is not that the nightmare is the quote invasion of Japan. It is the nightmare that there will be no organized capitulation of Japan's armed forces, which at this time frame was being roughly estimated as being four and a half to five million Japanese under arms. Uh, by August of 45, the Japanese actually surrendered. will actually have six million uh, men under arms at that time. No organized capitulation, not uh, the quote invasion of Japan, is really the ultimate American nightmare uh, scenario. Now, at the same time that the U.S. is going through this uh, convulsive debate about what to do, uh, the Japanese have uh, basically already figured out exactly what uh, the U.S. is going to do, or at least certainly what the U.S. Army thinks we're going to do. Uh, they began their very serious contemplation of an in-game strategy from their standpoint in January 1945. And the absolute fundamental uh, foundation of everything they're thinking is this, that uh, however powerful materially the Americans may be, that ultimately uh, their uh, morale is riddled and can be broken, either by actually defeating this first invasion of the Japanese home islands, or by inflicting such casualties that they will secure uh, political bargaining chips, that they can negotiate something far, far better than a 
Uh, ultimately, what they're looking at is at least the preservation of the old order of Japan, this uh, militarist, this nationalist order that scaled the war, this uh, the world, this war that's killed at least 17 to 20 million human beings. Uh, now, having reached that fundamental uh, decision about what they're basing their strategy around, they then uh, move through what probably is one of their best uh, sets of strategic uh, analysis that they do during the entire war. And basically, uh, they, they fear greatly that the U.S. will not invade, that the U.S. will choose a, a campaign of blockade and bombardment, for which they have really no uh, counter. But they decide that the Americans, not only having brutal morale, are an impatient lot, and will insist upon coming forward to invade promptly. Uh, they also calculate the following, that the Americans have never put uh, the number of ground forces in the Pacific that could match the number of Japanese could, uh, could place in the Pacific. Our uh, American combat power is based far more on naval and air power. About half the American air power, more than half the American air power is land-based. Uh, the Americans are going to bring the maximum amount of air and sea power to bear if they come to invade. That means, by definition, uh, at a minimum, they have to have uh, an invasion site that's within fighter plane range of their nearest land bases. They figure out, this is in uh, early 1945, they figure out by mid-year, Americans will be on Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Okinawa can support thousands of planes, Iwo Jima cannot. They simply put their dividers into the map. Okinawa will set it for the range of American fighter planes. It hits them in southern Kyushu or Shikoku. They figure out immediately southern Kyushu is by far, far better than site for American purposes for air bases and sea bases. And they realize that the American planned invasion will come to Southern Kyushu. This is Operation Olympic. And when they look at the topographical map of the Southern Kyushu, where that landing will actually take place um, is a no-brainer. It is there are only certain obvious places where you can land large masses of forces across open beaches on Southern Kyushu. And they pick out three of the four invasion beaches quite accurately. They then couple this overall strategic appreciation with this great mobilization when they bring uh, either to the home islands, they muster from the home islands, almost 3 million men. As you can see, they're setting up 60 divisions and 24, uh, 34 brigades. On Kyushu, they have about 900,000 uh, men, uh, and they will have 14 divisions and 10 brigades. Uh, I would point out also that although they're short of ammunition and supplies, they give priority to Kyushu uh, as being the place where the Americans are going to come first. Uh, they also go into a, a conservation program of preserving the aircraft, avoiding their combat, plus converting a lot of training planes into kamikaze, so that by uh, August of 1945, they're going to have like 10,000 planes. About half of them are already earmarked in kamikazes. Uh, the senior officers in the Imperial Army's uh, air component says he plans to actually use all of his planes as kamikazes if it actually came to the uh, invasion of Japan. And it's uh, doubtful the Imperial Navy would have been far behind in that sort of competition. And here, too, is another point uh, I want to emphasize. They conduct in March and April 1945 a series of uh, national legislative moves and then followed that by uh, practical moves where they uh, actually uh, mobilize as a great national militia, all males aged 15 to 60 and all women aged 17 to 40. Uh, this is a fact which I think has not been given sufficient weight in a lot of the uh, discussions about this period. By doing this, not only did the Japanese add this enormous number of uh, auxiliary forces to their order of battle, but what they, have, as a practical matter, have done, because they can't put these people in uniforms, is they've made it almost impossible for the average Marine or GI, if you were on Japanese soil, to distinguish who was and who wasn't a combatant in facing the Japanese within the home islands. Uh, they also raised significant uh, legal, moral issues concerning exactly who was a non combatant in Japan in the summer of 1945. There was one famous uh, Fifth Air Force intelligence officer, uh, intelligence summary, who, uh, summary officer, having learned about all this, said basically there, there are no civilians in Japan. Well, that is an overstatement, but basically the, the ability of the American forces to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants in Japan was substantially obliterated by this uh, procedure. Now, the next uh, step in this process with the Japanese was to uh, formally codify all of this work into uh, an imperial order at an imperial conference, which, which means the emperor signs off on it. This is what they do in June of 1945. Now, here again is another aspect about this period that I think deserves a lot more attention than it's got. Uh, that is that in, in preparations for this conference, as within all bureaucracies, the staff papers are assembled to 
examine and explain the situation. Well, when you read uh, these staff papers, the point I would like to emphasize tonight is they make it quite clear that even if Japan's uh, strategy, which they call Ketsuko, Operation Decisive, this political military strategy of defeating or inflicting great casualties on the first invasion, even if this, if this strategy is successful, Japan's food situation is such that they will be plunging into a famine state in 1946. As Ed Drain, in his uh, recent excellent book about the Imperial Army, points out, Imperial Army has understood quite clearly that adopting this strategy, that it was certain that literally hundreds of thousands, many hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians were going to starve to death, even if they were successful in their strategy. Uh, it is impossible, and this is one point I would have, if I had to do it over again, I would emphasize even more downfall. Now that I have a better understanding of this, no senior Japanese policymaker who reading those staff papers and knowing the, 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 uh, the total food situation again, could have failed to realize what those papers were saying about the likelihood of mass uh, deaths among non-combatants in Japan, even uh, as they uh, chose to go forward in June 1945. Now, the emperor up to this point, up to June of 1945, up to near the end of the campaign in Okinawa, uh, confessed after the war that he was basically as much a fervent supporter of uh, this uh, final strategy of Ketsuko as anyone else. It was only at the end of, towards the end of Okinawa that he began to, in a, in a feeble sort of way, to ask for the Japanese government to look for an alternative, to look to the Soviet Union to conduct mediation, perhaps negotiate out and end the war. And that has occurs right after the Imperial Conference where he uh, first uh, asked the government to do this, although they don't exactly uh, snap to uh, a suggestion or command. Uh, now, chronologically, though, let me, let me pause just a moment to go back on the American side. What meanwhile has happened as a result of the campaigns of Okinawa is that it's changed the mind of Admiral Nimitz. When Admiral Nimitz was solicited in, earlier in 45 about whether he could uh, support the invasion of Japan, Admiral Nimitz had said that he could at least agree to Operation Olympic was going to Southern Kyushu in November. However, after two months of Okinawa, uh, Admiral Nimitz jumped ship. He sends a message, eyes only a private message to Admiral King, the Chief of Naval Operations, in which he recites uh, the, the woeful uh, story of the uh, campaign and categories on uh, Okinawa, and says basically that there's no reasonable prospect that an invasion of Japan would be any, any less horrifying, and that he no longer could support uh, an invasion of Japanese Islands. Now, what does Admiral King do with that message? Does he share it with anyone? No, as far as we can tell, he does not share it with anyone. He puts it in his pocket. Uh, and remember, he's already said we're going to go back and revisit this issue in August or September, so he's got his little trump card in his pocket as he goes on into June. Well, Okinawa also influences another American. His name is Harry Truman. Mr. Truman is described by one staff officer as being very perturbed about casualties on um, uh, Okinawa. And he asks for a meeting on the question of whether the U.S. should invade Japan. This will take place at the White House on June 18, 1945. Uh, in the memorandum that uh, is issued directing the, uh, that this meeting take place by Admiral Leahy, the, uh, the uh, President's Chief of Staff and member of the Joint Chiefs, says that the, the criterion that the President is looking for on his decision is casualties. I'm not, this President, I'm not going to take you there on casualties. What I'm going to say is that that was what the President set forward. Uh, at this meeting, General Marshall takes the lead in the initial presentation. Uh, he presents the issue before the President's authorization of what's called Operation Downfall, which is actually the two-phase invasion, going to Kyushu in November 1945, that's Operation Olympic, then going to the Tokyo region in March 1946, that's Operation Coronet. Uh, during this meeting, uh, President Chippewa will, in fact, only authorize uh, Olympic. Now, what about Admiral King, right? He wants to kill the invasion, right? He has in his pocket this message from Admiral Nimitz, uh, saying, I can't support an invasion of Japan. So does he sit down in front of the president and say, Mr. President, I don't think we should invade Japan? No, that's not what he does. He sits at that meeting, and he appears uh, to be shoulder to shoulder with General Marshall on authorizing uh, the Kyushu operation. But if you read the minutes of that meeting carefully, what you find is Admiral uh, King also says, well, Mr. President, you know, we can order this thing now, but we can always cancel it later. So that's how Admiral Nimitz, uh, that's how Admiral uh, King finesses his way through this 
June, the 19th, June 18, 1945. I got my date wrong. I'm sorry. I was reading something about Midway. Sidetracked. I apologize. <laughs> now, swiftly, uh, another point about the new versus the old history is that in the, in the version of history which was fought over between 65 and 95, most of the argument about radio intelligence went to the diplomatic messages. Uh, the fact was, however, we now know there were actually two streams of messages. One was diplomatic and one was military. Uh, the summaries that were reaching top policymakers, including the president, uh, were called, strangely enough, the Magic Diplomatic Summary, which is self-explanatory. The other, uh, the other uh, stream, which related to military affairs uh, to the Far East, was called the Magic Far East Summary. Uh, to be very succinct about this, what the Magic Diplomatic Summary shows when you sit there and read it end to end is this, that the Japanese government had only one authorized uh, effort with respect to diplomacy, and that is the effort to open this mediation conduit through Moscow. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, back and forth about various uh, Japanese diplomats or attachés in Europe offering and presenting themselves as what I call peace entrepreneurs. But as the Magic Diplomatic Summary showed and the analysis told the policymakers, the fact was none of these people, except the ambassador of Moscow, had any authorization from the Japanese government to act on behalf of that government. So they were not legitimate. That included the guy in, in uh, the Vatican, about which whole books have been written. Uh, the second point uh, about this is that the Japanese leadership, and uh, at this time, the Japanese legal government uh, really is uh, the, the bulk of the power in that is with a group called the Big Six, which are the six principal cabinet officers in the, in the government. There are the uh, prime minister, uh, the foreign minister, uh, the navy minister, the army minister, and the chief of staff of the army and navy, and they're called the Big Six. And this little group, which means uh, which is the group that authorizes this uh, effort to the Soviet Union, uh, is really the center of power in Japan. And being a classic Japanese institution, how does the Big Six make a decision? Is the vote 4-2? Uh, the vote has to be 6 up. They have to have unanimity before they can do anything. And at no point prior to uh, Hiroshima does this body of uh, individuals ever sit down and formulate a set of terms upon which they think Japan should end the war. Not one moment. They have one instance in which they attempt to do this, and the war minister says the only basis on which you'll open discussions is that Japan has not lost the war. End of discussion. Now, the uh, culmination of, of this uh, diplomatic exchange, in my view, comes in, uh, near the end of July. The Japanese ambassador in Moscow, who's the man who's in charge of trying to conduct this uh, effort to uh, jumpstart uh, a, a, a mediation effort to the Soviets, uh, if, to my mind, if you read him, he, he, he reads like a cross-examiner on behalf of the Truman administration. He basically, when given the initial message saying, I want you to do this, he says, well, first of all, the Soviets will never lift a finger to help us. Then he says, well, by the way, Who's authorized this? After all, we've just adopted this at this imperial conference, this life of the Finnish with no negotiation. Who's authorized this? And the foreign minister has a sort of lovely behind his hands about what the authority of this is. Then the Japanese ambassador says, well, look, the Soviets are extremely realistic, and they're not going to take this seriously unless we can present them with terms. I have to have some terms upon which to uh, get the Soviets interested in mediation. And of course, the problem is the Japanese foreign minister, who's his communicator, communicator in, in Tokyo, can't provide terms because the government hasn't agreed upon terms. So in frustration, this Japanese ambassador in Moscow finally sends uh, uh, two messages, which are, I, I believe, very important to understand this. And, and he says, well, look, the bottom line is the best we can possibly hope for is the equivalent of unconditional surrender, modified only to the extent that we can preserve the imperial institution. Now, that sort of package, uh, unconditional surrender modified to preserve the imperial institution, is sort of a major talking point or argument point on this controversy. The fact is that this is presented by the Japanese ambassador to the foreign minister, and in the Magic Diplomatic Summary on the 22nd of July, you can read where the Japanese foreign minister in Tokyo responds to this by saying not no, but hell no, it's not satisfactory. So not only do we know the Japanese were not really responsive to an offer merely to modify the, the terms to include uh, preservation of the imperial institution, but American leaders knew this on the 22nd of July. Well, as grim as the diplomatic picture was, the military picture uh, was, if anything, worse. Uh, Ed Dre, uh, as 
first covered this, and I elaborated on it, and some other people have written about it since, but the bottom line is this uh, massive, massive stream of military intercepts, which were far more numerous and far more detailed than the diplomatic you know, messages, showed the Japanese preparing without exception for this Armageddon battle in Japan, and what was uh, worse was it showed that they had exactly anticipated Operation Olympic, that we were going to southern Kyushu. And I think I can best summarize this whole thing with these two maps. Over here on the left is what we thought the situation was going to be going in when we authorized Olympic uh, through President Truman's decision. And that's that there would be three Japanese divisions on the southern part of the island that would come in with these, our invasion force would be 14 divisions and about you know, over uh, 700,000 dollars. Well, as it turns out, what the Japanese had actually massed up in southern Kyushu was this enormous uh, combat power uh, of these uh, infantry divisions, brigades, tank brigades. Uh, as one of the famous uh, uh, intelligence summaries from that period read, uh, it now looks like we're going in on a ratio of one to one, and this is not a recipe for victory. So that's the military picture as you go into uh, late July and into the first days of August 1945. Uh, Basically, um, I believe that almost anyone who would have been president at that time would have done what Truman did, which is to authorize the use of the bombs under these circumstances. Now, the next point I want to touch on that I find quite interesting is when the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and the news uh, reaches uh, Tokyo, what's the reaction of the Japanese the military leaders to this news? Uh, what's to me fascinating is that they immediately erect two lines of defense, the first of which, particularly primarily by the Imperial Army, but, well, whatever it was, it wasn't an atomic bomb, and certainly we're not going to agree that it was an atomic bomb until we conduct an investigation. Uh, the Chief of Staff of the Imperial Navy, Admiral Toyota, his reaction is that, well, uh, even if it is an atomic bomb, the Americans can't have that many of them, they won't be that powerful, or they'll be dissuaded from using them by international pressure. And the point I would underscore here is that really, what's really startling about this, in my view, is that this attitude uh, of these leaders comes, uh, I think, fundamentally from the Japanese atomic bomb program. That bomb program didn't give them a bomb, but it did give them the insight that producing fissionable material, the, the stuff that makes the bomb, the atomic bomb, was such an enormous, not merely technical, scientific, engineering feat that uh, they didn't believe uh, that even if we had one, uh, that we could have had that many, that we had an arsenal which I would also point out basically tells you that the likelihood of a demonstration of one bomb persuading the Japanese to surrender is nil. Uh, following the bomb on Hiroshima, uh, during the uh, early morning hours of, uh, or during the night of August uh, 8th, 9th, the Soviets entered the war, uh, commencing an attack in Manchuria. Uh, this attack, and uh, finally, belatedly, after several days of delay, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, Big Six finally have a meeting in the mean morning of August 9th. Uh, going into that meeting, according to the Navy minister, there was still what he called a bullish attitude towards continuing the war. During the course of that meeting comes word of Nagasaki. Uh, obviously, word of Nagasaki tends to uh, undercut the idea that we have only one bomb. And as a matter of fact, before, the, before another 40 hours has passed, the Japanese war minister will start talking about the U.S. having 100 atomic bombs perhaps using the next one on Tokyo. Uh, I would suggest that that would indicate that perhaps the Nagasaki bomb had rather more effect than perhaps has been recognized. Uh, the Japanese leadership power, this big six, once again, which has to agree unanimously, is unable to agree uh, to surrender on less than four conditions. Uh, the four conditions are not only that the imperial institution be maintained, but basically that Japan will conduct self-disarmament, it will conduct its own tri trials of alleged war criminals, and above all, there'll be no occupation of Japan. Uh, in essence, these are uh, conditions that basically say that we will preserve the old order of Japan. We'll get something like the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, when this uh, package is originally presented to the Emperor's principal advisor, Kido, early in the afternoon, August 9th, Kido uh, finds it quite acceptable, which is a point on which historians now have been cogitating a lot because the Kido is the alter ego of the Emperor you have to assume that if Kido finds these conditions acceptable, then it's very likely that he is reflecting quite clearly, as he usually does, the emperor's own views. Which either tells you, uh, and, uh, one, one view of this is it tells you the emperor was really basically still shoulder to shoulder with the most uh, rabid militarists at this point, 
uh, or, uh, in my view, uh, that he was really concerned about uh, if they're going to obtain a surrender of the Japanese armed forces, if this is the minimum terms that the Army Minister will go along with, as the minimum terms are going to be acceptable. After, uh, later in the afternoon, as word spreads within the, the, the leadership elite uh, about this, the Emperor and Kido are uh, importuned by other important civilian officials who tell them the Allies will never accept this, and the Emperor uh, finally agrees to come around to issue an order to surrender after an imperial conference that takes place during the night of August 9th and 10th. Now, what's interesting about that meeting is that if you go through the transcript of the exchanges back and forth, and if you look at the later materials produced by the participants and their secondary uh, uh, judiciary figures, their whole course holders, whatever, is that nobody uh, mentions that in that meeting the intervention of the Soviet Union is mentioned as an important factor for why to end the war. The one reference to it is by the Army's Chief of Staff, uh, General Mizu, who says Soviet entry is unfavorable, won't miss the game, the Ketsuko strategy, and I say let's continue with the war. Well, the Japanese come out of this meeting with a decision by the Emperor that they're going to offer this single condition to the uh, uh, Declaration was set forth in American terms, and that's that uh, the imperial institution be preserved, except that the way it's phrased uh, is itself a separate story. The phrasing of the Japanese original offer says specifically uh, that they will accept, that the Allies must accept the prerogatives of the Emperor as the sovereign ruler. And what historians since the 1990s have pointed out, first in Japan and Herbert Fix and others have followed now, is that this was met as what lawyers call magic language. This is not just a set of uh, words that means we, we only want to figure an emperor or like a, uh, a, a British type monarchy. No. What this really means is the precondition to surrender. The Japanese want the Allies to agree that the emperor is going to be supreme, not only over the Japanese government, but over the Allied occupation forces. It's a veto of that. This is recognized by American State Department officials, which is why in Burns uh, turns it around and it gives them a very ambiguous response of which, nonetheless, the emperor decides he's, he needs to accept. For one reason we know is because uh, some Japanese uh, diplomats overseas are saying that if the Allies are asked to recast their terms, they're likely to make them tougher, not easier. Now, that brings us to the question of when the emperor does want to intervene, what, what are the reasons that he gives? And as a lawyer, uh, you know, one of the things you learn is that usually witnesses are most reliable when you look at their accounts closest to the event. What did he say then, not what did he say a year, five years, 10 years, 25 years later? But if you go through all the evidence that we have uh, on what the emperor says over these tumultuous days, you see repeatedly it comes back to three factors. The first of which is he's lost faith in this invasion strategy, catches up in the Imperial Army, generally. He repeatedly keeps talking about the domestic situation. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And he talks about fear of conventional and atomic but what's interesting is that he only makes one reference to the Soviet intervention on one day. He keeps uh, repeating these other issues as being the reasons why he decides uh, to surrender. Now, this domestic situation issue is, is a matter where we, we come in this conventional debate to focus a lot on what was it the atomic bombs or was the Soviet intervention which was the critical factor in bringing the Japan to surrender. Uh, the emperor, not only in this meeting, but in his two uh, uh, official scripts or statements that he makes pressure to surrender, uh, uh, talks about this domestic situation. What's he talking He's talking about, it's a code for the notion that what he's really worried about, as well as his principal advisor, as well as the Navy minister, is that Japan's internal trajectory, the, uh, the difficulties brought up by blockade and armament primarily, are going to uh, bring a revolutionary state to Japan in which the people themselves will rise up and topple not only the emperor but the throne but the whole imperial institution. When they talk about the domestic situation, that is the issue they're talking about. And it's now astonishing to me going back and looking at this, is that's been sitting, it's like the, you know, Edgar Allan Poe's forlorn letter, a uh, short story, but we've been sitting there in plain sight all this time. Why haven't we paid more attention to this? Now, now we come back again to uh, the uh, civil-military relations, or I guess in Japan we have to call this the ecclesiastical-secular relations over the years since the emperor was a god. Uh, the emperor and his warriors, and the question of were the emperor's warriors going to obey? Now the first thing I've listed here is this uh, 
coup attempt in Tokyo, which is about which a great deal of ink has been spread, has spilled over the years. Uh, I actually agree with some of the, the critics that say that uh, too much emphasis has been placed on that. I think now that we know how the players were lined up at the time, that as alarming as that event seemed, it probably was not itself uh, that threatening to uh, stop the process of peace. It, it is, however, significant because it shows you how rapidly middle grade officers were able to mount an effort to actually seize the Imperial, Ar uh, Imperial Palace from a standing start in 72 hours. It raises a very disturbing question of if the process is more protracted, these people have more time to assassinate people and recruit additional supporters, where would this have gone? But in terms of what happens on this particular night, I would not overemphasize or emphasize <coughs> the significance of that event by itself. What is interesting is this man, who is the vice chief of staff, number two on the operational side of the Imperial Army, He's reporting in his diary, which he's keeping, that after they receive word that the emperor is intervening in order to surrender, that senior officers are trooping through his office saying, you know, I don't think the overseas commanders are going to comply with the surrender. And Kalabi writes in his diary that he agrees. He's not at all confident that the overseas commanders are going to comply. And right on cue with his uh, diary entry, we now have from the radio intelligence, the intercept joint, that two of the three major overseas Japanese commanders specifically the man in charge of China, another was called the Southern Army, which is basically Indochina and on into the Pacific. Both of those officers initially respond to the, the word that the emperor is ordered to surrender, but the pithy response, hell no, we won't go, we're not going to surrender. And for several days, it's really touch and go as to whether these are going to surrender. On top of that, the Soviets have now uh, made a landing on the Kura Islands. Uh, the Soviets had a uh, tremendous they have tremendous land power, tremendous tactical air power, but they ain't got much sea power. And so their amphibious operation going to the Kura Isles is a very, very feeble uh, effort, uh, judged by their overall capacity. And they go right to exactly the place in the Kura Isles where the Japanese expected them to land, and very nearly get themselves uh, an island in their landing on It becomes extremely touching, though, because by this time the emperor has already uh, issued a broadcast on the 15th saying we're going to surrender. The forces on the Kuril Islands, however, refused the order to cease fire, both from their local uh, commander, and they initially spurned an order from the emperor. And uh, as uh, Tashi Hasegawa describes his embrace of the enemy, there's this really panicky uh, number of hours, about a day or so, in Tokyo, but they're really concerned that this episode in the Kuril Islands is going to start the unraveling of all of the compliance with the surrender. But eventually, uh, it does work out, and they do comply. But through about the night, between the Emperor's public broadcast on the 15th of August, and between about the 19th of August, there is this extremely perilous passage in which it's not at all clear in my view that the Japanese armed forces are going to comply. And now we come back to our buddy Admiral King, who's been uh, patiently waiting, looking at the calendar, and he's probably noticed by now it's August. I believe I said back in April that come August or September, we're going to talk about this invasion. Well, what happens is, at the same time that the the day after the bombs are dropped, because of all this dire radio intelligence information on Kyushu, uh, General Marshall sets down and sends a message to uh, General MacArthur. And what uh, General Marshall uh, does on 7 August 1945 is ask MacArthur in so many words, do you still think Olympic is a viable operation in view of this new intelligence picture showing the tremendous Japanese building on Kyushu? And General MacArthur replies on the 9th of August, basically uh, saying that I don't believe the intelligence uh, and uh, that we should go ahead with the operation. Admiral King, as soon as this exchange is uh, in, takes these two messages and puts them together in a package. And in typical Admiral King fashion, in a very short message, says to Admiral Nimitz, please provide your views with an information copy to General McCarthy. This is on the 9th of August. When I saw that message in the uh, uh, Commander Chief Pacific Fleet uh, War Diary, I thought, this is going to make for a very interesting reading <laughs> when, when we find out what Admiral uh, Nimitz says and what else there might be uh, lurking in here. And I went looking and looking and looking, and I enlisted the good, good folks at the Naval you know, History Center, and we went into we went into places that most people never go to, blue flag files, which are this hodgepodge of messages from 1945 out of chronological sequence, Real by real, frame by frame, and the bottom line was we couldn't find any response. What I did find was that about 13 plus hours after that original message comes through, comes in, 
Admiral King sends Lemus this message that starts with the words, this is a peace warning. This is the first Japanese peace offer. So the only conclusion I can reach from this is that Admiral Nimitz uh, held off on his response because uh, he thought that if the war ends, there's no point in going into what's going to be this colossal money between the Army and the Navy over whether uh, Operation Olympic is still viable, and if not, what exactly are we supposed to do? So now let me wrap it up here. Uh, I've gone pretty quick uh, over a lot of issues I have highlighted a number of things I think that are significant in terms of breaking out of the mold of uh, this controversy that's probably between 65 and 95 or so. Uh, and I'll leave you with a, a couple of final thoughts. Uh, first of all, as I look back now on how this controversy was shaped up in the opening decades, I think one of the, one of the fundamental problems with how it was framed was the notion uh, that since we ended up with the surrender of the Japanese government, <coughs> compliance of that surrender by all the Japanese armed forces, we take that as sort of the inevitable end of the world, the end of the trail. That no matter how we would manipulate events in between, that somehow this is the way it would have come out. Well, now, I don't agree with that at all. I think uh, that there was a very significant issue to what we were going to get in and we were very lucky with what we got. Second, uh, Admiral King, uh, in terms of civil military relations, what was his duty versus what did he do? Uh, I think, uh, as I can best understand his thinking, I think it went like this, that he, he was absolutely committed to the notion, as it was the Navy uh, institutionally, that invading Japan was really a path of folly, uh, that the U.S. could not sustain the kind of casualties necessary to, to conduct an invasion, and he believed that it was his solemn duty to prevent that from happening. He believed, I, believe, I think, in April 1945, that, that to prevail in that argument, he had to have a really powerful argument, and he did not believe he had that. <coughs> after Iwo Jima in the middle of Okinawa. And he believed that as the fleet cut loose from Okinawa and was able to impose the blockade on Marmon, he was even stronger, he would have the cards with them in his hands to actually be able to mount a powerful army who should not invade the Japanese environment. Consequently, when he got to this June 1945 meeting, he decided to temporize. That rather than force a confrontation at that point, at which he did not think he could probably win, he thought there was time to come back to the issue, as he told his colleagues at the JCS later in the year, uh, about whether the invasion was necessary. Now, the question is, when the president says, I want to have a meeting about this policy, and I want everyone's candid views, should King have been more forthcoming at that meeting? That's an issue over which I think people can follow and chew for a while. The other thing I want to talk about in terms of comparing contrast is the emperor. I think one of the one of the problems in understanding the decision-making by the Japanese emperor in 1945 is that there were two issues uh, that uh, were basically radioactive, radioactive to use the term, uh, with respect to confessions by the emperor about what motivated him. Uh, all of this, trans the great majority of this transpired in the context of after uh, the end of the uh, war, the priority of the emperor and a lot of the Japanese elite was to preserve the emperor and the imperial institution. There were two things that they were not prepared to really uh, fess up to the Americans uh, about at that time. Uh, one was that the emperor, who they'd been holding out as being the great symbol uh, to which all Japanese much must obey and heal, uh, they couldn't admit that well, there was a time when we were really worried that the civilian population was going to rise up and knock, knock me off the, off the throne. That was not an argument that was conducive to keeping him on the throne after August 1945. The second thing that went along with that was he was not about to talk loosely about the notion that the Japanese armed forces might, to some major degree, uh, they could admit, just a little coup attempt or whatever, but they couldn't admit that senior officers in the Imperial Army were likely to have refused to obey the emperor. When in fact we know that there's evidence that certainly for a while that was in fact the case. So I think that the emperor himself had some rather significant issues on civil military relations. Uh, it made an interesting uh, uh, counterpoint to those of Admiral King. And with that, now that I've led you into submission, I will uh, cease the torture. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Sir, first, Ian. Well, as I 
an attorney and make a compelling case, a very interesting case. Uh, I have really just a piece of anecdotal evidence which seems in a small way to support your argument. Uh, Bedford County, Pennsylvania is releasing a documentary this next week featuring interviews with World War II veterans. And one of them was in the Army Air Corps on a B-32 flying a recon mission. You may know about this, uh, you know, contemporary mission with the uh, surrender ceremony and was attacked by five Japanese fighters uh, and shot, well, yes, and lost. The only casualty, I think, was a photographer, but still a casualty after the surrender. Uh, and I find that compelling and also the circumstances about who was in command locally and why that attack was ordered, et cetera, et cetera. So, certainly seems to support in a small way or larger argument about the refusal to surrender. Thank you. Uh, what do we know about what Admiral King knew about the progress of the atomic bomb, either at the end of April or in the June meeting? It's a good question. Uh, I think the, the, the fundamental point to bear in mind is that while they, they knew about the project, progressing along. We were receiving reports. Uh, nobody was going to vest uh, all their faith that that was going to come to fruition and, and what would happen afterwards. You really don't see, uh, you don't see really uh, uh, efforts to really prepare for the prospect that the bomb might actually end the war until the latter part of July, when they issued some orders for Nimitz and MacArthur to prepare plans for uh, a Japanese collapse and immediate occupation. Uh, nobody, you know, nobody's certain. In fact, the, the other point I would add to that is even even when uh, the order is given by President, well, he's given by Sherman through Marshall and, and the Army in the Civil War, uh, bear in mind that that order is not for you know, the use of one bomb. It's, it's a list of cities, and it says, you know, starting from uh, 3 August, I think it is, you can start dropping these bombs as they become available. Uh, it's it's open-ended because no one is. Stimson goes off on a vacation, or plans to go off on a vacation after Hiroshima, because he doesn't think that even the single bomb is going to produce a surrender. Uh, the, um, the Army senior intelligence officer, uh, the kind of guys we always get to beat up on after we have, right? uh, he sends a memo to uh, Marshall on, I think it's the 12th or 13th of August, and says basically, you know, the Japanese will have large forces in Japan, they need to fight off, we're not going to organize capitulation. The atomic bombs will have no effect for another 30 days. So this is, you know, I think that encapsulates the sort of thinking that no one at that point um, foresaw or, or prepared to base their planning firmly around the notion that the atomic bombs were A, going to work, and B, were going to uh, secure a surrender. Uh, you mentioned it's a Navy and Army problem, but the my readings of some of the JCS minutes is the Air Corps, the Army Air Corps, was very much against an invasion also. Um, and that Admiral Leahy uh, was wildly opposed to the, the use of the bomb itself, thought the blockade and uh, bombardment would, would be the answer. So wasn't it really just the ground component that, that saw this? My, my reading of, uh, when you go back through that, is that the problem the Army Air Force had at that time was that uh, they were in sort of this uh, pledge of allegiance to General MacArthur. And, uh, and almost all the, in the, in the final showdown instances, they stand shoulder to shoulder with Marshall on going ahead with that. Now, at the same time, without a doubt, they were much more enamored of blockade and bombardment as a strategy. Admiral Leahy, um, one of my Bet in the war. Admiral Nagy wrote a memoir, it was published in 1949 or 50, in which he depicted himself as having been vehemently opposed to using the atomic bombs. And that's been used repeatedly in these things. If you go back to the contemporary documents, no one is, you know, as Bart Bernstein has pointed out, uh, no one has found any, any contemporaneous record that Leahy at any point prior to Hiroshima ever expressed that view. It was written down. The one view that we know that Admiral Nagy did express vehemently was that the atomic bombs are not going to work, right? He was an expert on explosives. These things, believe me, guys, these things are not going to work. That was his position. Um, and as you, you know, indicate, you know, the Navy strategy was this blockade, but what did I indicate? I mean, you have to think about what did that really mean in terms of the means of ending the war when you talk about atomic bombs versus blockade. 
And one of the other things I didn't touch on here, but you know, it's very interesting is that uh, I found it that It's a good example of you know serendipity when you use castles like that. You know, I went, I went looking into post-war records of the occupation. I was primarily looking for the question of how many guys were mobilized and how much weapons and ammunition were turned in compared to the Japanese numbers they were given on what they had. But what uh, in that same track of records, the thing that just absolutely poleaxes you when you look at them is to realize that how very swiftly after the beginning of the, the occupation, we realized the Japanese were in a desperate food situation. And the situation was going to plunge towards uh, really famine in 46. And uh, one, of the, one of the stories about the occupation, which my, which to me is startling, is uh, underplayed the, the American accounts, although interestingly in the Japanese accounts it's played up, is that had we not sent food aid to Japan in 46, which Joe McCarthy pushed for, probably one of his most redeeming moments, uh, they, they would have they would have plunged into big time famine. It would have killed many hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Japanese. And that uh, the, in these Japanese accounts of the occupation, uh, there are effusive comments about you know, how critical this was to secure the peace. It was, it was that demonstration that had that not happened, it would have basically destroyed our credibility and not everything else we were going to do. Yes, Albert Angel, uh, U.S. Navy. Um, quick question. You mentioned that Marshall didn't uh, quite agree with their, the intelligence. Um, that the buildup was. General, General McCarthy. General McCarthy didn't agree. McCarthy didn't agree. Um, up to that point, it seems like the intelligence was doing doing pretty well, especially uh, the code breakers and, and uh, ascertaining uh, Japanese movements. Um, you know, the killing of Yamamoto and a lot of the, uh, the victories by you know Nimitz and the, um, the battles that took place during during Late Golf. What would lead him to uh, you know not trust the intelligence at that point when it had been so successful? Well, you know, um, let me elaborate on that a little, a little bit more of the story. In that message that Admiral, uh, the General Marshall sends on the 7th of August to McCarthy, uh, General Marshall says in that message, is it, is it possible, words essentially the fact of, is it possible the Japanese have figured out some method of hoodwinking our intelligence? Uh, I think what Marshall meant by that was he also is on the start of see these massive armies rising up from these locations in Japan. So, um, uh, to give MacArthur his due, it's not like his idea was totally zany and totally off the reservation. It's not in current Marshall also. Um, but MacArthur, um, MacArthur's subject, uh, you can have me back in a few years to MacArthur. Um, uh, MacArthur, uh, the best study on him by far, the use of intelligence by Ed Ray. And Ed basically points out that, you know, when when the intelligence favored what MacArthur wanted to do, he thought the intelligence was fine and followed it. You know, when it didn't support what he wanted to do, he ignored it and did what he wanted to do anyway, which is a pretty fair assessment of how it went. Um, one of the things in that message that MacArthur sends in the 9th of August, which is really, even, even those of us who have very strong stomachs and have read a lot of the stuff by Norman MacArthur, it's just really something Chinese. He said, well, in the past, it's always, this has always been the past. Just as we're about to go in someplace, the intelligence shows this draconian, terrible position, it always turns out to be false. This is well, in fact, it's just the opposite. Uh, will it be under, undercounted an awful lot? Under so, I always say, you know, it's, General MacArthur, it, it, it's important to hate General MacArthur, but it's equally important to hate him for the right reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you touched on this briefly, but I was wondering if you could kind of uh, expand on something you said earlier. Um, erasing the enemy, Hasegawa says that uh, the Japanese surrendered primarily because of events that were happening in Manchuria. Um, the counter-argument to this is that the people in Tokyo really had no idea what was going on in Manchuria, that they only had these, um, they got these vague reports that they thought were much more optimistic than what was actually happening there. So I know this is probably not a thesis you subscribe to, but what is the response to that? Uh, how can you say they surrendered because of Manchuria if they had no idea what was going on there? Well, that's, that's kind of an argument I make. Um, this is uh, the whole issue of, of Japanese decision making in 1945 is made extraordinarily difficult by the fact that a lot of stuff was not written down. And a lot of stuff that was written down was disposed of for various reasons. So you have a tremendous, 
be honest, you have a tremendous problem in uh, calling out for what we do have, uh, what's real, what are the nuggets, and what, what's really the draws from there. Uh, I don't uh, totally discount the significance of something you mentioned. Uh, I see it as important in securing the compliance of Japanese overseas commanders for this room. And so that's where Hasegawa and I uh, disagree. I, I see the bombs as being primary because I think if you read through this, they were more central to the Emperor's decision. The Emperor doesn't make his decision, the whole process doesn't get started. Therefore, I give privacy to the bombs. But your point is right. When they're making the critical decisions in that meeting in the early morning hours of August 10, 1945, the Japanese have very vague information uh, about what's going on in Manchuria. Uh, in fact, they don't even know about this major Soviet thrust from the West. They don't, they're not going to learn about that until the, the 10th, which is after the decision they can just up. So, you know, this is, uh, a large part of this also, there's a big psychological element here. You know, who, who can like atomic bombs and their results? You can't, right? So, there's this resistance. Uh, part of the resistance of this is the notion that it will negate or deny the significance of them. Uh, my view is you've got to look as clear-eyed as possible at this, and also you've got to count all the dead, not just the dead in Hiroshima, but most people don't realize that there were an enormous number of Japanese non-combatants who were killed or disappeared in Soviet captivity. Uh, you can do the numbers so that it turns out the more Japanese non-combatants who died because of Soviet invention that died as well as the bombs. Not to mention the fact that every day the war goes on somewhere roughly three, six, more thousand Asian non-combatants are dying in China and elsewhere in Asia. Every single day the war goes on. So uh, the issue is not whether there's going to be uh, an end of the war involving the death of non-combatants, but it's you know, how many and who are going to die. And I have a big problem in a, lot of, in a lot of respects with this controversy over the issue of I certainly am not going to ignore or uh, gloss over the, the, the effects of those bombs on those Japanese who died, but I'm not going to ignore the Japanese non-combatants who died in Soviet captivity or the other agents who are dying, not to mention the POW, they don't take the Sir? I have uh, one thing. I remember back in 1970, I knew a, a Japanese couple. They were about 38 years old. And they did say their favorite book was Gone with the Wind. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was in 1970. So, <laughs> anyway, the question I have is, uh, sort of relates, relates to the Civil War. Uh, I wrote a book about uh, Harry Truman. And he did say, they quoted him, I guess this is true, he said the proudest thing he ever did in his life was when he was in, he got that unit back from World War I without any casualties, except for one guy, I think, that went to some other unit. He said that was the proudest thing in his life. So I was wondering if the Japanese, they didn't know that they were facing somebody that just isn't going to take any more casualties if he doesn't have to. Would you think that was part of Truman's thing, too? Um, uh, the one thing that really comes through when you, when you read this stuff, read Truman's diary, read uh, the comments of staff people who were dealing with him a little bit ago, uh, read uh, most poignantly, I think, uh, Truman's com uh, uh, Churchill's comments in the Potsdam Declaration. You know. uh, Churchill sends this message back talking about how he had this really heartfelt meeting with, with Truman and Truman talking in the Churchillian phrase of this unlimited effusion of American blood. That the casualty issue was, you know, extremely critical. I mean, and the whole meeting in June 18th was over the issue of casualty. So Truman was was extraordinarily sensitive to that issue, and extraordinarily, you know, uh, in an extraordinarily difficult situation. Uh, one of the things about Mr. Truman is, you know, we have these two terms as president. We have this imagery of him now very precise. But in these moments, in these weeks after President Roosevelt died, he was um, about as alone a president as he ever had. He had no one around him. He had no staff that he had assembled prior to becoming president. His cabinet officers were all inherited from, uh, from uh, Roosevelt. Uh, he was a man very much left to his own devices to, to uh, get through this. Uh, it's almost, it's, in some ways, point is in some ways pathetic, reading about how he's going home at night with all these papers to read up on what, what has gone on, what, what, what is Roosevelt's policies. He says he's going to execute Roosevelt's policies. What are those policies? He can't always tell. Uh, but he was a man very much cast upon his own inner resources to make those decisions. And he was not this domineering, 
make this decision right now. So the guy at that point was ready to take One of the things that we're looking back today through the perspective of the Cold War and with an understanding of mutually assured destruction, our perspective on nuclear weapons is that it's an almost unimaginable threshold. To what extent, if you look at the firebombings, you, you understand that they really didn't have a problem with mass destruction. And I'm wondering to what extent did they understand the atomic bomb as crossing a threshold, and how serious was the discussion to the extent that, well, we might not use these things, or because I've heard it described as sort of taken as a given. Once we get them, we're going to use them. That's a very good uh, question. Uh, first of all, I think uh, one of the really important contributions to this whole issue has been the, the, the formulation by Bart Bernstein at Stanford. And he looked at uh, some of these early uh, writings by Alperovitz and others in their revisionists or the critical camp. Um, and Bernstein's assessment of the decision-making process is what he called the implementation of an assumption. That from the moment President Roosevelt authorized that program to go forward to make that law, it was implicitly understood by everyone who participated that, by God, if we did in fact manufacture a bomb, it would be used. Of course, initially against Germany, later against Japan. So uh, that, in a very important respect, I think Bernstein is right in that that's how Truman and his the advisors reacted to this was that basically the assumption was it was going to be used. There was no, there was no uh, sort of like, oh, now that we have a bomb, I wonder whether we should use it or not. It was, it had to, the process had to be stopped. Uh, it, it was an automatic mode to be used uh, absent some decisive uh, reason not to use it. The second thing, this is a really fact, when you read some of the stuff on the, the policy debates on this, uh, we, we now all have these tremendous uh, images in the back of our brains from all these uh, video, uh, television, movie things. We've seen these horrendous pictures of these blasts, the effects of them or whatever here. Uh, weapons vastly more powerful than those bombs that we used to make the time. In fact, in the debates, I mean, the, the equivalent power of the bombs are talking in terms of 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 times. We had the capacity by early August 1945 to send 1,000 B-29s out on one mission, each one with 10 tons of explosives. That's 10,000 tons of explosives. And in one of the policy debates, there's even someone says, well, you know, what's really going to be so different about the explosive power of these weapons versus a conventional way? Uh, and, you know, of course, Oppenheimer says, well, it's going to be a little more spectacular. They're 10,000 right? tons. But uh, it, it, and that also gets into the issue of why does it take multiple bombs? Because the power was not so enormously beyond the present capabilities, uh, at least at that time, to see them. But there's still, uh, and I think you get the sixth sense when you read this stuff, there's no, there's no fundamental sense among most of the participants that they're leaping over some great wall divide. We've gone down this long path through Europe and then uh, in Japan, uh, uh, understood bombing over here. So that this is you know, sort of another step down the path. No sense, like, you know, we're, we're now vaulting over this great program uh, that we've lived up to have. That was just not the way to see. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on to the, you know, internal dynamics among the senior leadership. You know, why did, why did King have such a muted opposition to the land invasion? Why did Nimitz refuse to, to, to go forward in, in uh, bringing that up? I mean, what were the personal professional relationships among the leaders that caused this kind of unit response? Um, well, as I indicated, on the, on the Navy side, there was this deep institutional, I mean, somebody, some lag once uh, pointed out that, you know, they all, they all came out of the Naval War College when these studies war plan orange and war and they were genetically coded to execute war plan orange. That was, that was the way the Navy turned them out. Yeah. And part of that war plan orange was the notion that they, to the degree they looked into the end game, they really had come to this institutional conclusion that the invasion was a fault. It's really what they thought about. It, just, it was not a doable operation in terms of the ability of the American people to sustain those kind of categories. So both Nimitz and King are stamped basically on that. And then you have, what you have to look at is we're now into 1945. 
and uh, basically about 60, what, 62, 64 percent of all American battle deaths occur in that one year span between the 1st of June 44 to the end of May 1945, as we go into Europe and then the campaign in the Pacific. And then Iwo Jima and Okinawa, you know, where the, the numbers keep getting uh, worse and worse. Uh, so that they're, uh, they have this you know, very heavy sense now that the chief operations are over everything now is going to be very costly. Uh, so they, they really, uh, Emmons and King, share a common belief. They're looking at the mention of the same facts and reaching the same conclusion. What, what's interesting to me is not what, in some respects, is not what King does, it's the fact that Nemitz was willing to go on record saying, I, I support going to Kyushu in, in early in uh, 1945. That was sort of breaking out of the whole of the Navy thinking. Uh, but then he, you know, he gets a taste of Okinawa and he's right back to the old. Uh, on the Army side, uh, by that time, you know, John Marshall had, uh, you know, is truly this you know, inspiring, dominating uh, leader you know, within the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Combined Chiefs of Staff within Washington. And his, his cloud in Washington in 1945 is up here. Truman's is somewhere down there. Because they know, everyone knows what they're dealing with with George Marshall. They don't know what they're dealing with. And with that, beyond that, I'd like to start answering the line. And one more up here, so you get the last one. <laughs> My name is Andy McIntyre, and I was on the faculty at the Army War College from 93 to 97. I taught two courses that had some relevancy. Uh, one of them was uh, nuclear, biological, toxin, uh, radiological, chemical warfare. The other one was arms control. Interesting combination. Two comments. Uh, I had a photograph that I used in the, uh, the weapons of mass destruction, as we call it, course. And what it was, was it was one of the members of the air survey team that went into uh, Hiroshima at the end of the war. There were 205 air surveys done. And there was one done there. And what it is, it's a tech sergeant. He's at ground zero. Okay. And this is very, uh, the five, incidentally, of the uh, air survey team members, five of them died in combat. So they went in very quickly after the, the action actually occurred. And this man's holding up a handful of dirt and he's sniffing it. Okay, so what's the relevancy of that? Well, the question back here was, how much did we know about these weapons? And I would submit to you, given that photograph, we didn't know much, or they would have been briefed in, you know, they'll sniff the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the other interesting thing was in one of the arms control courses, uh, I had a Russian, and I engaged him in uh, a conversation as to how the Russians regarding nuclear weapons. And this brings into perspective the points of views on nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, being an American, we believe that everyone thinks like we do. But that's absolutely not true. Uh, we're in the minority, to be quite frank with you. They saw nuclear weapons as just another explosive. And uh, their command and control was not like our command and control. Uh, Quite frankly, they had a lot more freedom than our commanders did. So, given that, uh, I hear these uh, debates here in the United States, but they don't hold much uh, water with me because it's coming from the emotional part of the argument and not from the, the uh, time perspective, the time that the decisions are made. Uh, and the uh, factors that are influencing those decisions. And I thought I'd share that with you because I thought that would add uh, a little uh, dimension to your presentation. Yeah, well, it's clear that in 45, certainly the top leadership levels, like Rose, uh, Oppenheimer, the scientists understood that a time bomb would produce radioactive fallout. Uh, as uh, one of the scientists, Norman Ramsey, once said, at, at the time in 45, the general belief was that the, uh, this was a, a very limited radius of danger, and that basically anyone who would be close enough to receive uh, a lethal or severe dose of radiation would have been killed by blast or heat anyway. So it was sort of a mood issue. And when the first reports came of significant uh, radiological uh, issues with respect to Japan, uh, there was 
liberal disbelief by Groves and Oppenheimer and others initially uh, over. And this ties into one wrap up. When, when Marshall is confronting the fact that obviously Olympic uh, does not look viable based on the way it's set up in New York, and he has one of his staff officers go to the Manhattan Project, uh, and the transcript, the telephone tra transcript is available, and what that shows is the, the staff officer says Marshall thinks that either two bombs are gonna, on cities are going to get a surrender, or no amount of bombs on cities are going to surrender, and therefore, you know, from this point forward, I want to know how many bombs you're going to have, because he's obviously thinking about using them tactically to support the invasion of the nation. And what transpires in that conversation is there's no hint that radio, radioactive uh, fallout is an issue with respect to American troops uh, going in within a very short time after the bomb blast. The only issue which definitely gets everyone's attention is, what if we drop one of these and it doesn't go off? Then what do we do? And the guy from the Manhattan Project says, I thought about this, I think about 40 hours. Mr. Frank, uh, thanks very much. When Army people talk about the Pacific War, the general tilt toward our uh, conversation is, did the Marines know how many soldiers were there? Because there was a lot more than there were Marines. <laughs> but we also know that this is a naval-dominated war. For all of you uh, naval officers in the audience, I told you we'd get one here for you this, <laughs> this year. But more importantly, what we do here at the Army War College is, uh, is we, we train our officers on how to think about uh, strategy, how to think as senior leaders. This has been an excellent discussion of how those senior leaders in World War II addressed one of the key difficulties that, uh, that we had. This has been an, an enlightening discussion for, I believe, everybody here. And uh, what I'd like to do is, on behalf of Lieutenant Colonel Mark Viney and our uh, the entire staff of the Army Heritage and Education Center. I'd like to present you this uh, copy of your uh, your poster, and uh, just as a small token of thanks for your presentation. Well, thank, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. That's a very nice photograph of Admiral King. He's, uh, I, I, uh, I, in fact, have recurred from the archives what I believe to be the only known photograph of Admiral King smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and the official caption says that this was snapped at a reunion of his Annapolis Class. I believe, based on my research, that this photograph was snapped as he was enjoying one of his only entertainments, which was watching a naval officer being flogged for talking to a reporter. 